Hey everyone, I'm Zach from World of Game Design, and today I'm going to teach you Vampire the Masquerade 5th Edition. As this is a horror game, I've recruited my darker doppelganger, the other Zach from Horror Epics, to help with this tutorial. Say good evening, Zach. Good evening. Excellent. You'll be seeing him replace me in specific portions of the video, but before we get into it, however, let me propose a word of warning. This is not going to be your standard vampire tutorial. Neither Zach or myself are LARPers, tip of the hat to that community, um, and so our approach to this game is going to be a little bit different, a little bit more centered around the aspect of rolling dice and looking at character sheets. If you want to dive into this game in a different way, more of that live action role play, um, might I suggest a different video and we'll post a few links down in the comments. Both of us have been neck deep in Vampire and a campaign of it for this past year, and we've had an absolute blast sinking our teeth into this system. Let's get started. So, as Zach mentioned, we'll be examining this game more from a place of how to run a casual one-shot or a small campaign set within what is known collectively as the World of Darkness. Vampire the Masquerade is a game which may touch on several sensitive themes throughout, so let's talk a bit about that. Upon first reading through the core rulebook for Vampire the Masquerade, my initial thoughts were that I could have a lot of fun with the storytelling mechanics of this game, and that those mechanics and related themes would require a lot of trust and intraparty consent by association. Vampire the Masquerade and other related games such as Hunter the Reckoning take place within a shared setting, which is an alternate version of Earth, colloquially referred to as the World of Darkness. Within this setting, supernatural creatures and entities such as vampires, werewolves, magi, even demons exist. But the terror comes not from fighting against these creatures as foes, rather from the repercussions of being exposed as one of these creatures within modern society by one of the various organizations which seek to reveal your existence to the world and eradicate your kind from existence. This opens up the resource of available horror beyond the supernatural and allows storytellers to fully explore real-world issues in-game in authentic and scary ways, which could be difficult for some players. Vampire the Masquerade is undoubtedly the most popular game within this setting, and it also offers the trickiest balancing act of any of the World of Darkness games, as the entire party plays as vampires. Here's why that could be such a dilemma for some. Where other World of Darkness and similar games may deal heavily with horror themes and the weight of real-world issues entering the gaming space, Vampire the Masquerade is a game which requires ongoing consent, and a lack thereof as the very nature of being a vampire requires you to covertly feed on your victims, many of which are unsuspecting and unwilling. Doing so may require narrative exposition, which can push the boundaries of what is considered appropriate. This can be tricky territory for inexperienced storytellers, as it only takes one player at the table taking things too far to break up a game for good. And this game certainly provides ample opportunity for bad actors to take advantage of those moments if certain ground rules are not established early and reinforced often. The game and setting also offer a strong tie to and reinterpretation of Abrahamic lore, which could be upsetting for some. That said, the game also offers a rich wealth of lore to really sink your teeth into, and with a good group and some solid ground rules, you can tell a truly terrifying story. In the campaign which Zach runs for our group, friendship, trust, and true caring are wrapped up in suspicion, fear, and a quest for answers. Our coterie has made a pact to not murder indiscriminately and leave no trace of our passing through a particular area, which means making good faith efforts to always feed as humanely as possible, even if that's not with the victim's consent. Creating characters which can narratively feed your party is a must for this game, but more on that later. First, let's check back in with Zach and learn about some more of the basics. Vampire uses exclusively D10s to resolve everything. You'll be building a dice pool and searching for a 6 or higher on each die. This means you have a 50% chance of getting a success on each die, and the storyteller will set the number of successes necessary for an overall successful task. Routine tasks may only require one success, while a moderate task may require three, 
and a nearly impossible task could take seven or more. To build your dice pool, your storyteller will tell you which attribute and skill you get to add together. This is similar to how a DM in Dungeons and Dragons will ask for an attribute plus a skill check, like Dexterity Stealth. But unlike this, in Vampire you have a completely separate score for both your ability and your skill set. Skills aren't based on attributes. So if your storyteller asks for you to make a Dexterity brawl check, you're going to tally up both your dexterity score and your brawl score to get the total number of d10s for your dice pool. If your dexterity is four and your brawl is three, you're going to be rolling seven dice. You should expect an average character to be rolling around three to five dice per check, though more or less are certainly possible. Each ten a player rolls on a single die is equal to half of a critical. So for every two tens you roll, you get a full crit. Crits double the number of successes on those two die. So two tens means you actually scored four successes, not just the two. Half crits don't get you anything special um, other than a normal success. If you get more successes than you need for a specific test, you have gained a margin. Some abilities give you cool things to do with your margins, but your storyteller can also give you a fun bonus as well. Here's a quick example. Your storyteller asks you to roll a wits plus politics check as you square off against the peons of a local prince at a formal banquet um, and they set the difficulty for maneuvering through the event's festivities at two. You have three points in wits, but only two points in politics. This means you're going to be rolling five dice total, and you need two successes to maneuver through this. You roll a two, a five, uh, two sevens, and a ten. The ten is a half crit, but without another one, it just counts as a success like the two sevens. This means you have three successes, awkwardly, um, against the difficulty level of two. You have succeeded. What's more, you have a point of margin, meaning you've pulled off the evening with an extra dose of grace or tact or charm, whatever fits the flavor. Your storyteller informs you that you've managed to perhaps tip a couple of representatives, these peons, into your favor here. Okay. What if two characters want to contest each other in some sort of an action? Then they simply roll off, with the storyteller determining the attribute and skill for each of the contestants separately. Someone might be rolling wits plus politics, and the other one might be rolling something completely different, depending on what they're trying to get out of their given task. Finally, there's also something called hunger dice. These are also d10s and represent how much your own beast is trying to claw its way out of your mind and form. Typically, hunger dice are represented by a different color of dice, like red die, um, in the game. When you have hunger points, you replace regular d10s in your dice pool with a number of hunger dice, or hunger d10s, equal to your hunger total. So if your hunger total is 3 and you're rolling a dice pool of 5, Three of those five dice are now hunger die. Succeeding or failing with a hunger die in your dice pool can mean slightly different things, but in general, hunger dice play by largely the same rules as we've already covered. The only true difference is when you roll a 10 or a 1 on a hunger die. If you roll at least two 10s and at least one of them is a hunger die 10, then you spark not just a critical, but a messy critical. Meaning you succeed, but not without your own beast manifesting and breaking through. This can be a lot of fun and is normally described by a coordinated effort of both the player and the storyteller. If you're in the middle of a combat uh, and you're trying to not let your beast out, but you roll that messy critical, maybe you sink your fangs into a nearby NPC, and that kind of blows your cover. Something like that. If you roll a 1 on a hunger die, and 
also don't meet the difficulty for the test set by the storyteller, you have hit a bestial failure, which means your inner beast manifests again, but this time in a very inopportune manner that's largely determined by the storyteller. This is not going to go your way. Not only have you failed at what you were trying to do, but your beast has been let loose. For now, you should have a good grasp on the dice rolling, D10s, all the way. Thanks, Zach. Let's talk a little bit about creating a character in Vampire the Masquerade, which can seem a bit overwhelming at first, but it's actually pretty straightforward. If you're anything like me, your first instinct may be to run to whatever you use to keep track of your character concepts and start scribbling down ideas. I did. And my character didn't end up too far off my initial conceptual path, but let's just say he was far more Patrick Bateman than what he ended up being. And while I'm very happy with the character that I've created, looking back, I might have altered him even further beyond my initial conceptual path had we done a character creation session, which is something that, when I run my own vampire campaign, I will absolutely include. But why is party focus so important, you may be asking. The simple answer can be summed up in one word. Coterie. A coterie is a small group of people with shared interests or tastes largely free from outside influence. Almost like a clique. In Vampire the Masquerade, your coterie is your family. You've died, you've been reborn as a vampire, and now you're a creature of the night, which feeds on the blood of unsuspecting victims, possibly even killing them in the process. Having a group which you can feel beholden to a uh, family you can feel accountable to is a huge part of maintaining whatever little may be left of your humanity and your sanity as you fall even further into undeath. I want to be clear. Getting along perfectly with every member of your coterie and being a bucket of sunshine all the time is not what I'm talking about here. Rather, there are no lone wolves in this game. Attempting to create an isolated and overly independent character will likely lead to more problems than your typical tabletop debacle, as this game truly thrives on and promotes party connectivity. Imagine your character almost like someone struggling with addiction. You require support to hold on to the parts of yourself which you still value, and in doing so, you find a family of like individuals who you may absolutely hate at times and they likely enable the parts of your new life which you struggle the most with. And you do the same to them, in turn. Having mixed feelings about the other members of your coterie is probably a healthy and probable choice for most players just starting out. But let's talk about how that enabling may manifest with a closer look at feeding and the other mechanics it preys upon. In Vampire the Masquerade, players constantly struggle with the mechanic known as hunger, which Zach highlighted earlier. As a vampire, you constantly grapple with the need to feed, which means running the risk of being caught, exposed, or otherwise compromising yourself, other vampires, or the masquerade as a whole. As we've already discussed, failing rolls on your hunger dice can have tumultuous in-game narrative effects, allowing your character's inner beast to rise to the surface and gain control. And the results will seldom favor your objectives, though such opportunities can often make for incredible role-playing moments. As mentioned previously, in this game, your party is something known as a coterie. This should make your character choices particularly informed, as the way your character interacts with and supports their coterie is a major sticking point of an effective campaign in this game. When creating a character, you'll be able to choose from several different vampire clans. In our campaign, I play as a member of the Ventru clan. These are what you might expect from a modern vampire. High society, fairly old rich, influential, etc. The list of clans is truly expansive, and it really does offer something for everyone, especially with the Anarch and the Camarilla supplements, which uh, explore two of the three vampire factions, and the different clans within those factions and their relationships to the Masquerade. The other faction, known as the Sabbat, also has a supplement, but the player options here are less focused on individualized clans and more so the fanaticism of that faction as a whole as they seek to actively undermine the Masquerade and openly dominate humanity and, and the Camarilla. As a vampire, there are a number of horrifying abilities which you can choose from when building your character. To start, you just allocate pips to certain skills and traits which when combined with other character choices, allows for a litany of unique and esoteric character abilities which you can then use to dominate foes, feed on unsuspecting victims, erase memories, charm enemies, and a hell of a lot more. But as monstrous as your character may be, they likely start the game with some significant portion of their humanity still intact. 
and it will likely be very important for them to hold on to what little remains. This is where establishing good ground rules for your coterie and creating ties to their humanity really comes in handy, and it also creates more amazing opportunities for top-notch role-playing. Whew, that was a lot. Let's turn it back over to Zach for something which is actually a bit simpler in this game. Let's dive into combat before we hit the wrap-up. Now, Vampire isn't a combat-heavy game, so this is going to be a little lighter of a section than it sometimes is. In fact, you're likely to go multiple sessions or even whole stories without needing to throw down at all. That said, when the claws and fangs come out, you're in for a furious and dramatic session. Let's get into it. Within the rules, combat is referred to as conflict, and there's actually two sets of conflict rules in the base game. There's a simple set, and there's a more advanced set. Now, today, we're just going to go through the simple rule set and kind of briefly touch upon what makes the advanced rules so well advanced. So for the simple rule set, combat takes place in turns, and each character gets to act within a given turn. In D&D, we call turns rounds, but here they're just called turns specifically. There's no concept of individual turns, however. So in D&D, there's a bigger round, and then you get into individual turns within that round. Here, it's just all one big turn. At the start of each turn, all player characters declare their intent. Then the storyteller determines the intent of the NPCs. And finally, the storyteller determines the dice pool necessary for each chosen intent. One person may be rolling a Strength plus Brawl, while another is rolling Composure plus Firearms. Whoever is squaring off against another character compares their number of successes against that of their opponent. The person who has the higher amount wins the turn, and subtracts the difference between the two from the opponent's health. As an example, if I score three successes and Shadow Zack only scores one, I would deal two points of damage against his health. And if one person is actively attacking, but the other person is not, like say someone is shooting at you and you're running, then you winning as a defense doesn't mean that you deal any damage. It just means that you avoided the damage of the gunfire. By the way, if ranged weapons are in play, there's always one person attacking and one person evading, typically with a dexterity check. If both people are shooting at each other, then both people will need to roll both a firearms test and a dexterity test. It's only when you get into, like, <clears throat> melee, where it, which is more prevalent in Vampire, and that's where you see, like, brawl-on-brawl brawl action, where there's just one die roll of the same sort, and then you compare the results one-to-one. -one. Now, what if two characters are attacking the same opponent? Well, then the opponent will get to make a contested roll against each one of them. But they'll subtract one die from their dice pool when they do so. Um, it's not a fair fight, after all. And if a character wants to attack multiple opponents, right? So in that, that case, it was two opponents attacking one character. This time, it's one character attacking two opponents. That's going to be even more difficult. You'll have to split your single dice pool um, amongst both checks. So if you are going to roll a dexterity brawl, you're going to say, oh, my dice pool is six. You're going to roll three dice over here and three dice over here. Now, vampires take two forms of damage, superficial and aggravated. Also, humans take these both, but the rules are a little bit different for what counts as superficial and what counts as aggravated, depending on whether you're a human or a vampire. But keep in mind, in this game, you, the players, are playing vampires. Superficial damage for humans comes from things like fists and boots, while vampires also treat weapon damage from standard gear like knives or uh, gunfire um, as superficial as well. This damage heals quickly, while aggravated damage is life-threatening. Guns and knives deal aggravated damage to humans, while things like fire, like, like, like burning, um, sunlight, and the claws and teeth of some certain types of supernatural creatures are some of the ways that vampires can take aggravated damage. It's very limited in scope to what deals aggravated damage to you, the vampire, much more broad for humans. 
Um, both kinds of damage, however, apply against the same health pool. Um, you may have like eight boxes of health, and once that eight boxes are checked, once that quota is reached, you are impaired. Take more damage while you're impaired, and you start turning any superficial damage into aggravated damage. So maybe you took six points of superficial damage, and then two points of aggravated damage during the fight. That filled up your checkboxes. Well, taking any more damage of any type, and you start crossing off those superficial ones and turning them into aggravated instead. Um, once you filled up your entire quota with aggravated damage... You're either dead or in severe uh, uh, torpor, which is a special type of vampire thing. Again, torpor is just this uh, state of basically paralysis where you as a vampire are unable to move, unable to do anything, are very much helpless. It's a great time for somebody to drive a stake through your heart or otherwise end you permanently. Recovering from superficial damage... It's just a matter of resting, right? Uh, if you get punched uh, in the jaw as a human, you can sleep it off. Um, but healing aggravated damage takes more time and also some medicine checks. Um, so if, as a vampire, you get shot up during a fight and you take those six points of artificial damage and only two points of aggravated. Sleeping off a night, you just clear through that superficial damage and you're back to only two points on your track. Uh, then you make some medicine checks to see how much you're going to remove of, of that true aggravated damage. That's the long and short of the simple rules. As I said earlier, we're not going to cover the advanced rules here, but just so you know kind of what you're getting into, there's a whole range of additional options for things you can do in combat, from different actions like maneuvers to blocks things called all-out attacks, and there's things like minor actions. These kind of make it feel a bit more noodly, like a D&D combat. There's also additional alternative ways of resolving combat in the advanced combat section that actually make things simpler um, for making each conflict resolve in a single roll to limiting the number of turns to three for any engagement, things like that. I encourage you to read through those options after you've played a fight or two um, with the basic rule set, and maybe you'll find that there's something there, a different way of doing combat that you and your table prefer more. That's the long and short of it. Combat is all about contested roles and getting to the resolution quickly. I can't imagine a world where you're waiting through a fight for a full session, but you'll probably find yourselves dealing with the repercussions of whipping out your fangs and claws for a long time to come. That's it, folks. That's the video. I hope you enjoyed it. This was not our standard form of an RPG, but I hope you really got the sense of the, that there's a lot of incredible aspects to this system. It's well worth having on your shelf, and it's well worth exploring as your time allows. It's doing some really unique things with the concept of a character and a character sheet, and it's really interested in telling great stories, and I think all of that comes through, and it gives you a very different feel than what you might uh, be used to with things like D&D or Pathfinder. In the next year, we're going to be spicing things up around here. You'll still be getting how to play videos, but they're going to be a little bit more sporadic. I'm thinking we're going to shoot for maybe one every couple of months or so. But in between, you're going to see a wider variety of tabletop content as we start to dive back into some of the games we've already covered with a deeper delve. And then we are also going to start highlighting more of our own content. Thank you to the nearly 1,000 of you that have managed to subscribe this year and we really appreciate that accumulation you've really been a delight to create for and i've enjoyed uh seeing your comments down in the comment section of each video and responding to most of those if you like this video uh i would ask you to su consider subscribing to our channel we have a lot of great content and different playlists all centered around getting you into a, more rpgs and making those games better if you have specific tabletop systems that you'd like for us to go over, drop them down below in the comments and we'll get to them when we can. We'll look and respond frequently on these videos. We also have a podcast. It's called Geeks Can't, and it features myself and a couple of my Yahoo Game Master friends 
sitting around the table talking about things that came up at our tables, uh, various games. We're talking about Kickstarters that are live, RPG news in general, and we also interview creators by the dozens. Go give us a listen if podcasts are your thing. It's also recorded live on YouTube, Twitch, and Facebook each and every week. Again, you can expect a video like this about a different system every month or so moving forward with a sprinkling of other game content in between. Until then, we'll see you next time. God, I hope that worked. I really hope that worked. Because it took me 45 minutes. Again, I, it's, not, it's not faster this time. It's not faster doing it again. But thank you.